I am here because I have a message to share with you all that I think is the most important message that people on this planet need to hear right now and today. This is the most pressing issue of our times, yet it is the least talked about. We are not recognizing the chronic illness epidemic that is sweeping across the Western world, um, and it is affecting children most acutely, and it is affecting American children most acutely. American children are the most impacted by this. So before I get into this epidemic, what it is, and also what we can do about it, because I, I really do think there's a whole lot we can do. I'm actually not a doom and gloom person even though you might feel that way for a few minutes when I give you some really scary statistics, I have tremendous optimism. I know there is so much we can do, and I want to share that message of hope with you as well. Um, but just before we get into that, I wanted to share a little bit about who I am. I got into this through my own kids. Um, and when I was a young mother, I didn't know about autism or ADHD or allergies. It didn't really affect me because I grew up healthy. I was always a healthy person. I ate organic. I was an athlete. I thought I lived a healthy life. And then I had kids. And when I had my kids and they were little, they started showing all these symptoms. And so I went around to every doctor, gastroenterologist, allergist, psychiatrist, you name it, looking for answers, what's wrong with my kids? And I was so lucky because I didn't get a diagnosis. Why is that lucky? Because if I'd gotten a diagnosis, I would have been put in a box, and then I would have been marched along, what you do when you get a diagnosis? You take this pill and you see this specialist and you do this thing. I didn't get that which felt very frustrating at the time, but it was such a blessing because without a diagnosis, do you know what I kept doing? Digging for answers. Why does my child have sensory uh, symptoms? Why does my child have skin rashes? Why does my child have uh, neurobehavioral issues going on? And as I dug deeper, I actually looked at my kid's physiology, what was happening underneath the surface, and I worked with holistic and integrative doctors, and you know what I found out? I found out there were all kinds of imbalances in my kids' bodies that precipitated or created symptoms. And you know what else I found out? Totally reversible. You can fix those things. So I did. But as I was going through this recovery journey, which is what I call it with my kids, I also had an awakening. Because I saw amongst all my children's peers, all the kids on the playground, in the daycares, in the preschools, I saw the same symptoms over and over and over again. The rashes, the tantrums, the kids who couldn't sit still, the kids who couldn't focus, who couldn't concentrate, the kids with chronic bowel issues, the asthma, the ADHD, the autism. And I thought to myself, this is insane. This is not normal. So I went on a quest to find out what was going on, and that's what resulted in my book, A Compromised Generation. I talked to researchers, I talked to scientists, I talked to parents, and I talked to parents who recovered their children or fully reversed these conditions in their children, and I learned a whole lot in that process. So much, in fact, that I um, worked with a couple other people to start an organization called Epidemic Answers, which is dedicated to helping parents find healing solutions for their children. Uh, helping parents understand what are the root causes of their child's condition and what can they do to help their child get on the road to recovery. So when I began this journey, this is what I saw. A giant, big, fat elephant in the room. I love this picture, though, because I don't know if you can see it, but the elephant in the room in this picture is actually camouflaged in with a wallpaper. And this is what I think is going on today in terms of the number of sick kids we have in this country. It's like the giant elephant in the room. A lot of people know it's there. A lot of people see it, but they're kind of like rubbing their eyes and they're like, do, do I really see this elephant in the room? I'm not sure. It's kind of camoed in with the wall. It's kind of there. I sort of recognize it. I know my own kids are sick. I see that kid over there sick. There's a whole lot more autism than there used to be. But no one's really confident enough to step up and say, something is wrong with our kids. Hey, you guys, like to shake people. And that's what we need to do. We need to see the elephant in the room. And this is what the elephant in the room is. 54% of our kids have a diagnosed chronic illness. That's diagnosed. I'm not talking about the kids who don't have a diagnosis or who have chronic symptoms like my kids. My kids didn't fall into that category, but they were very sick. 
That is unacceptable because what happens to these kids when and if they grow up? What does that number become? I'm telling you right now, this situation is dire. We have no time to lose on this. If you go back just a few decades, less than 10% of children had a diagnosed chronic condition. Less than 10%. It was a rarity. It's like when I was a kid growing up, I remember having one friend who had asthma. One. There was no ADHD. I don't even remember the symptoms of ADHD in my school. There is certainly no autism. Our, our special needs department only had children with Down syndrome in it. Now we have a child in every single classroom in America with autism and two paraprofessionals, sometimes three paraprofessionals, in every single elementary classroom. How is that normal? How is that okay? And if we take these rates and we project forward just a few years, everybody, the vast majority of children will have some kind of diagnosed chronic condition. So this is the new normal. Our kids are sick. When I started this talk and I said the epidemic of chronic illness, which is the, the um, subtitle of my book, most people kind of scratch their head and like, what does that mean, chronic illness? Because when you think of chronic illness, or at least when I think of chronic illness, before I kind of started on this journey, I was thinking about, you know, older people who are overweight, have diabetes, heart disease, people who've, chronic illness in my mind reminds me of people who drank, smoke, had crazy lifestyles, and their bodies are kind of starting to break down over 70 years. Chronic illness is not supposed to impact children. Children are supposed to be healthy. But what we're seeing is skyrocketing rates of asthma, ADHD, allergies, autoimmune conditions, gastrointestinal conditions like Crohn's, colitis, neurobehavioral disorders, autism, autism spectrum disorders, things like PANDAS, which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Asso uh, Disorders Associated with Streptococcus, um, Lyme, chronic Lyme, obesity, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, didn't exist in children until the modern couple of decades, the last couple of decades. Type 2 diabetes is skyrocketing in children. So that's our new normal. And this is also how we're talking about it. We talk about each epidemic as if it's its own thing, as if there's the autism epidemic. And you hear a lot about the autism epidemic, which is terrific, because we now have a lot of awareness about it. Why do you think we have so much awareness about it? Because there's just so much of it. Are we better at diagnosing autism? And is part of the increase in the number of children being diagnosed with autism due to better diagnosis? You bet it is, but it is absolutely not the only reason why we have more children with autism today. There just are more children. So this is this chart you've probably seen before, which is showing autism and its growth rate over the last few decades, going from virtually zero before 1930 to now one in 45 children with a diagnosis of autism. So there are people who are projecting this forward. Stephanie Seneff, who's an MIT researcher, has said that we're going to have one in two children and 80% of boys diagnosed with autism by 2025. There are other estimates out there that, you know, if you take the 13% the annual growth rate of autism over the last couple of decades and you project it forward, you're looking at one in four children by 2033. So, you know, there's all different kinds of estimates out there. I don't care what the estimate is. None of it's acceptable. None of it. Because think about this. If, if autism affects boys to girls in a ratio of four to one, how many boys are there going to be that don't have autism or some kind of neurobehavioral disorder? And I'm not talking about, you know, 2075 or like the year 2200. I'm talking about my grandchildren. My grandchildren, how are we going to sustain an economy, a society without boys? How is that going to happen? We see autism as its own thing. So we're trying to understand what is happening with autism, this phenomenon, like it's its own thing. And then we look at other conditions, like allergy. We have an allergy epidemic. We have an EpiPen in every single classroom, practically. Every school bus is now carrying EpiPens. If you go into the nurse's office in the elementary schools, there are walls of EpiPens with the kids' pictures next to them because they might die if they eat something they weren't supposed to. 
So we talk about the allergy epidemic, and that's terrific. You know, we're, we have more awareness about it. We talk about other epidemics, the autoimmune epidemic, for instance. Autoimmunity was something that rarely impacted children. Something like Crohn's disease, for instance, you should not impact children before the age of 15. But now you have parents going into their gastroenterologist's office and getting Crohn's diagnoses at three and four years old. How is that happening? But again, we're seeing these things as if they're their own entity. What's really going on here, and what we're not seeing, is that this is one epidemic. One epidemic of chronic inflammatory conditions. There is this common denominator across the board that all of these conditions have this inflammation. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what these conditions all have in common. But you look at any of these conditions, whether they're developmental delays, learning disabilities, mood and behavioral disorders, joints, breathing, gastrointestinal, inflammation is there. So there's something that's connecting the dots here between autism, asthma, and depression. People think they're their own things, but they're all related. And there, there's this whole other piece that I alluded to a moment ago, which is that we have, we know more than half of American kids have a diagnosed chronic condition, but we have all these other kids who are undiagnosed and whose statistics are falling through the cracks, things that we're not really tracking well, but are signs or soft signs that these kids are impacted by this epidemic as well. So things like reflux in babies. This is a really interesting phenomenon to me because I was a new mother who participated in, in baby playgroups and was around a lot of other new mothers who had babies, and the single most common thing I saw was babies vomiting after they drank breast milk. Breast milk is the perfect food for babies. But we have an entire generation of babies that can't tolerate their mother's breast milk. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. A lot of it has to do with um, the mother's internal um, microbiome, which I'll talk about a little bit, the mother's toxic load, and also the food sensitivities that the mother um, has and actually can, can carry on to the child. But what are we doing for this reflux? We're putting babies on Prilosec and Prevacid, and these proton pump inhibitors that actually destroy their gastrointestinal system and set them up for more chronic illness later in life. This is how we in the modern world deal with these kinds of symptoms. That's just one of many things that are going on. It's a soft sign. But there's others. You know, all these kids are coming up with thyroid conditions. Eosinophilic esophagitis is a mouthful to say. But it's a word that mothers in suburbia are running around and saying. Why? Because it's so common. Oh, your child has a xenophilic esophagitis too? It's a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the esophagus. But it's common parlance now because it's so common. But do you think anyone at the CDC is tracking a xenophilic esophagitis, a chronic inflammatory condition affecting babies and young children? Nope, we're not tracking it. So we don't know what's happening, and we don't have reason to be concerned then because we're not looking at it. There's a whole host of other things that are going on. Chronic constipation, chronic ear infections, chronic sinus infections, self-limiting feeding, kids who only eat white foods. How many people know kids that only eat white foods? The carbohydrates, milks. That is a sign that that child is impacted by this epidemic. There's so many more things that we're not tracking.